Evening. And um, yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for, for tuning in. And um, I'm hoping that uh, we can get through quite a bit this evening. Look, I suppose what, the reason I've sort of chosen this topic really is because, um, you know, there's a lot of interest uh, amongst down at Paddleboarders uh, for our rear canoeing. And, um, and actually vice versa, you know, so there's this cross flow that's going on, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, when you sort of nail down as to why this is, and also, I'd like to talk about the advantages for, for standard paddleboarders of saying, of, of getting into something like our rear canoeing and understanding, you know, what are all the different areas of it that you can be involved with. Um, and in addition, you know, just, just looking at the, one, of those, one of those interesting anomalies, if you like, but when Stand Up started, um, we started seeing our canoeists coming into the sport and uh, they excel pretty quickly. And I've got a bit of a list here, you know, there's Travis Grant, there's, there was Jamie, Jamie Mitchell, uh, Danny Ching, uh, George's Cronstead from Tahiti, uh, Stevie Boy also from Tahiti Rete, Eb also from there, Tituan, who's from New Caledonia, and um, <coughs> Annabelle Anderson, she even was a, a canoe, our canoe paddler from New Zealand. Sonny Honshai has bought herself a, a OC one, I think it was about a year or a little bit more ago. Um, so, you know, that, that's a nice, interesting point to talk about because that's, that's a gene pool that came straight into the sport. And of course, you know, they, they knew how to swing a paddle, but more than that, they had special um, attributes which, which made them go, go quickly. There were anomalies, of course, there are a lot of uh, other paddlers that were on the scene too that went very quickly, you know and the Connor Baxter and Kyle, any of those sort of guys, and they come from a multidiscipline water sports background. So what I thought I might do, I'm just gonna play you a clip. I'm hoping I can get this thing to work. Um, and um, so this is a six man outrigger canoe. Actually it's called a bar because this is in Tahiti. Whilst you're watching it, you have to take into consideration, you know, these guys have been born and bred into this. They probably started compiling canoes when they were four or five years of age. They're now grown men, piling in a team called Pire, which ruled the roost for something like 10 years in uh, all through the, pop, the French Polynesia. Uh, one of the greatest teams that was ever put together. But it's the skill, the dedication, the time, the effort, the expertise, the way they chisel their bodies, the, the way they train, the diet, uh, the support of the community, ocean knowledge. All these things come together. And you can see this is hardcore. This is not something that uh, could be taken lightly. To get to this level of ability, you know, this takes an awful long time. Mostly, what I would like to appreciate is that when you paddle on your own, you can only push yourself so hard. When you get into a team situation like this, your levels go through the roof because you don't want to let anybody down. So you go to another level. And um, there's nothing like it. The feeling of accomplishment in being in a team situation is absolutely incredible. That was an upwind section. Here they are coming downwind. I'm just taking into account, you know, just look at what they're doing. Look at the biomechanics, look at the movements they're using, look at the paddles they're using. You know, you, I'm sure all of you as standard paddleboarders can see yourself sitting down and going, yes, that's cool. I'd like to try that. <laughs> so, let's fast forward a bit. There you go. And um, yeah, so Chris, if there's any questions coming in, just let me know. Yeah, we'll do, Steve. I'll yeah. uh, interject okay. as and when. Um, yeah, for me personally, I, mean, I, I, I grew up in West Africa and, um, you know, and uh, I was exposed a lot to 
well to dug out canoes and so you know to me when I got involved that area of canoeing it, it was no big uh, sort of surprise to see these canoes that people were paddling and I was introduced by a bunch of Maori guys in, in uh, Australia this was back in the um, uh, sort of the late 80s and uh, it just instantly caught my imagination I come from a kayaking windsurfing background it was a no-brainer to, to get involved the reason I want you to sort of appreciate this is that you know I, I want to sort of instill some concept, some idea that, you know, standard paddle warning is not bereft of having a cultural connection. And that's really important. I, the reason I believe it's important is it, it'll, it helps your connectivity to the sport. Instead of being a shallow, not shallow experience is the wrong word. I don't, don't want to run, run that down. But the point is that it gives you some tangible thing beyond just a piece of plastic and a paddle. Uh, you know, this is more than that. It has historical context. And uh, standing and paddling has been around for thousands of years. Um, this, for example, you know, is an interesting thing to consider. This was 1874. These are American, Native American Indians standing and paddling and racing in, in, uh, in, in canoes. And, you know, this is something that was well known. Um, look at the paddles they're using. You know, it, it gives you sort of a, an eye on the go. That's interesting. Okay. So actually, you are, in fact, a part of this, whether you know it or not. And it's nice to think, oh, actually, historically, that's, there's a touchstone there. There's something that goes a long way back. And, um, you know, it, it should resonate with you and make you think that actually once, once you learn these paddle skills, you can apply paddle skills in the context of canoeing to a whole multitude of different types, types of canoe sports in particular. You could even go to surf, ski or kayak. But, you know, for those of you that don't already paddle other craft, you know, here's, here's the, the opportunity to think, to think in a broader, broader perspective. Um, so, interesting concept this is a uh, traditional fishing canoe and um, this is uh, what Hawaiians would have had years ago just to go fishing and they never had the in they, they did some racing uh, very very rudimentary it was just a bit of bit, bit of fun really they used to race these style of canoes in Samoa and Fiji and Tonga and the Pacific they would just race them um, but there was no design specifically for racing per se there and but they used to race for big things they'd actually race for a woman or they'd race for some land or you know, fishing rights so uh racing then was actually very serious in terms of the prize but the actual craft used were rudimentary they were basically just just fishing craft you know and they weighed a metric ton they were they were just uh they were what they were these are all hand carved from koa which is a bit like mahogany you can see all the all the rigging, uh, how it's rigged together with Senate, um, and it would take hundreds of hours to to create. Consequently, these are sacred craft. You know, there's this uh, something that's very sacred to them. Which sort of brings me around to you know a few sort of discussion points, which is like, for example, I've I've mentioned I've been quoted on Wikipedia saying things like you know, Steve West, author his author historian says you know that stand up paddle boarding is more connected to our rear canoe than it is surfing and you know the point i want to make here is this is that you know if if we want to say the waikiki beach boys were the guys that sort of kicked this whole concept of standing and paddling on boards then you need to understand who who they are i mean these guys the waikiki beach boys they started doing concessions on off off the beach in waikiki in around about 1902 and they were taking tourists out and uh, it sort of grew and grew right through the 20s and the 30s where they would take people out canoe surfing uh, and um, they would hire rent out surfboards for sure. But the idea of standing and, and paddling, they would just take a very, very long paddle. You can see the guy down the bottom there with a the very long paddle. He would literally take that paddle and stand on the board, a surfboard and paddle around in the flat water and they were using it to uh keep an eye on people in fact they were even taking photographs at one point um with nikonis cameras you know sort of selling those to the tourists so you know it was sort of plausible that you know this this was because they had paddle skills not necessarily because they had um you know um uh, the surfing skills which they certainly did is it a combination of the two well certainly it could be conceived as that as well um but we already know that the sport's quite splitting and the standard is splitting into different fractions we've got those that surf those that race those that do downwinds, those that like flat water. So, and that's dictating designs of boards as well. So, you know, in terms of what, what we conceive for, for people to stand on and surf or to stand on and race. 
And of course, we know that dugout style canoes are, sorry, stand up paddle boards are um, indeed one aspect that, that, uh, that seems to be, um, you know, not, not going to go away. Um, here's just an image of uh, canoe surfing. And I think that what I was going to sort of draw your, your attention to is the fact that Arrow canoeing is extraordinarily varied. It's got so many different facets to it. This is one of them. So you've got the racing component in six man outrigger canoes. You've got canoe surfing in three man and four man surfing canoes. And beyond that, you've got the single canoes. Some have rudders and some are rudderless, which I'll, you can have what well, we'll discuss it in a moment. Um, so, you know, it's very varied. And these guys are all watermen. They're all skilled and they, and they, they, they take their hand at anything. They'll try anything. You know, they're just uh, crazy like that, which is a brilliant thing to do. Now, obviously, if you live in Hawaii and live in some of these countries like Australia, you've got all those raw materials and the ability to do so. It's a little trickier in some countries, but you just have to sort of, you know, dig a little deep and find the right contacts. And if you can get involved, then, you know, absolutely, why not? So here's a little aspect. This is not something else to consider. This is canoe sailing. So now canoe sailing is another point. It is outrigger canoeing. And because it's outrigger canoeing, it's in, well, part of it, it's included in that family. And um, it's steered with a paddle. And, you know, this is, this is out, well, my own personal canoe that we sail here in England. And, um, you know, whenever we sail it, people are amazed that you're using it, steering it with a paddle. But again, it's all about paddle skills. Um, so I'll just run that, uh, just run that. A little bit. So the skills here are all learned really from steering six man canoes where you've got, you have the steer at the back and that's where I learned to steer. And then from there I can take it into sailing a, uh, a uh, Hawaiian sailing canoe, which um, combining windsurfing knowledge as well, so that helps, helps that as well. So you're now extracting the marrow out of all sorts of different weird areas of water sports that, that uh, you know, suddenly are presented to you. Um, so, you know, here's, here's a situation of, you know, this is a Molokai Hoi, or not what Inioki Kai, as they call it. This is the women's race. Um, now you'll see six girls paddling, but they're actually, they're, they're 12 in a team. They're doing, uh, sorry, 10 in a team. They're doing changeovers, you know, they, they're, they're, they're after so many minutes of paddling, maybe 20 minutes or so, or even less, 12 minutes, uh, even eight minutes at times. Two or three paddlers will get out, swimmers will be in the water and they'll change. So they're refreshing paddles all the time. So again, there's extra level, these layers of skills that these, these girls have to have and the guys in order to, um, you know, to be able to participate. You've got to be, you know, an, a genuine water athlete in terms of being able to swim as well and, and actually not be scared of water as a lot of people remar remarkably are. So, um, you know, so this is sort of painting you a picture, you know, where these, these area canoes are coming from, you know, this is, this is their world, you know, the, the ocean world. And, um, you know, many of them are just, uh, you know, they, they, they've been hardened and chiseled over many years of doing what they do. Um, Steve, do I just yes. interject there? I'm um, going back to that previous picture. Um, and no doubt we will talk about this later in the presentation, but looking at the size of those paddle blades, they are pretty big. And um, is this something that you're planning to uh, chat about later on in the, in the webinar? Yeah, I've got a little section on the paddles and um, <clears throat> yeah, well spotted. I mean, they are quite meaty and they're, they're probably around about nine inches or so. And, um, but they're quite long as well. And I think that the thing about, you know, we'll talk about lever arms because, <clears throat> you know, you've got a fairly short lever arm and the lever arm runs from the lower effectively from the lower arm the lower hand rather to the point which is the widest point on the blade which is the center of effort of it so the shorter that is you know the more you can rely on power from the body effectively but of course as it gets longer you start to sort of thinking more in terms of levers and that becomes very problematic too which is why it's actually why standard paddle warning is fundamentally very very difficult and very hard on the body 
Um, and so, you know, this is why, you know, oddly enough, the technique in standard paddleboarding, if you kind of get it wrong, it's going to do you damage, it's going to hurt like hell. Uh, whereas in our rigging, you can kind of, you know, if your technique is a bit off, you know, it's not so bad apart from the usual shoulder injury, which is, just, which is the same between both sports. But again, it's still worse in stand up because of the sheer length of, of the levers we're talking about. So, yes, good question, Chris. We can, we can certainly address that, that, that part of it. Um, but again, just note, note the positions of the, of the arms, you know, top and bottom and the rotation and the, just the way that they're placing the blades. So all these, all the fundamentals still apply, you know, the, the setup, which is where they are, but that they're just at the entry there. They've just gone from the setup phase. Uh, they've gone into the entry, <clears throat> they'll then move into the catch. The catch is a very mysterious thing. We, there's another, another discussion we can have one day. <laughs> and then from there, so, yeah, they're pulling a rope through, through rot rotating effectively. Um, and then through to the the exit and the recovery. So, you know, um, all these things are terms that you should be familiar with. Um, it's just an example of how racing Hamilton Island in Australia. This is race lady for, for many years. And, um, you yeah, this is the sort of conditions we had to put up with. Uh, on, and we, we, we enjoyed this. This is a good day. You know, you 25 knots of wind and nice and rough, big currents. Uh, and... Uh, the crews that were used to this and enjoyed it, they would excel, obviously. And the ones that weren't, didn't have the luxury of training in these conditions would, would struggle. But, you know, <clears throat> again, look, look at the intensity of this. And, and that, that could go on for eight kilometers, eight Ks, nine Ks straight up wind. And this, this particular race is 42 kilometers with changes. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty intense on the body. So, again, you're getting an, an, an idea. This is the world. That, Aria canoeists coming from if they're multifaceted, like the guys like Travis and Danny Ching and, and those guys, what in the background they come from. This is what all what they endured for years. Just another shot of the men's Molokai of a Molokai crew. <clears throat> Here's just a brief, a brief one. This is me paddling with in Fiji. This is uh, again, it's an inexperienced crew, but Manny sitting behind me. We're just going for a morning paddle, seven o'clock in the morning. And it just gives you an idea what it's like. I'm sitting at seat one on the stroker. I'm setting the pace. You're sitting at all, you're paddling on alternate sides and you'll see me cool in the huts and where we change sides. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just, uh, just run that. So again, I'm just going to stop it there. But you know, <clears throat> for example, you're looking at the setup of the body and everything that's going on there. These again, these are all facets of the stroke that you should be used to, and they're, they're all discussion points. You know, I paddle with a, a bent top arm. People, some of like paddle straight top arms. That's the massive discussion point. You know, we're taught uh, to rotate through the through the torso. It's all about body rotation, you know, that's, that's how we, we have grown up with our rear canoeing. And uh, there are some factions like to use a straight arm, but the majority have got the, got the cocked arm back. Um, but all the principles are there. So this is, again, just at the, just at the entry phase I'm going, I'm going through. And there I'm already through, already, becoming, already coming through to the exit. And then you've got the exit recovery. You can see the swing coming back, relaxed wrist, relaxed elbow, relaxed shoulder. And that's the time to breathe. <clears throat> and again, all relevant to, to what you would do if you were paddling uh, stand ups. <clears throat> One of the aspects of uh, Ari Kuning is interesting is, is, the, is, the, is, is the culture, is the ceremony. So there's a lot of blessing ceremonies going on that we have in the race in the Pacific. You know, I think that's not uh, some of this that, that, that binds us and makes us keep, keep very sort of tight connected to the sport. Um, it's quite strange in the Pacific because a lot of us uh, have lost, maybe lost our religion, uh, you know, uh, maybe don't believe in things about Christianity the way we should. Uh, a lot of guys and girls gravitate towards the, the Polynesian beliefs in a sense, even though it's quite Christian sort of based, but, you know, 
through the work of missionaries. But I think what's interesting about it is it's still fundamentally grassroots. It's still got a lot of uh, uh, cultural touchstones, which people re resonates with people, even the extent of getting tattoos and getting involved in the whole, the whole process. And that's, that's great. You know, it fills a ma massive void in people's lives. So again, that's another interesting part of outreach really canoeing and uh, another good reason to, to sort of consider embracing embracing the sport it doesn't matter whether you've had one man v1 six man you're still part of this big family <clears throat> here we are in tahiti i mean these these heaver festivals uh, they've been uh this they've been doing these since the 1870s or so and um every year they have big races in july and these are two these, are, these canoes are all rigged together they've got they're basically actually they've got they have V. These are called V sixteens, which are really unusual. So it's eight people in each canoe, canoe, which is really strange. But that's what they do. And then you have there are these. You can have six bands and join them together. And it's called a twelve. It's a twelve man canoe. But here we have eight per canoe, and you've got sixteens. Quite unusual. Only place, only place in the world that does it. Um, but this Heaver Festival was huge. I mean, there are probably three, four thousand paddlers go into this uh, every year. Uh, so if you ever want a real treat, get to Tahiti in July and watch the Heaver Festival. It's just absolutely insane. <clears throat> so, uh, how are we going? No questions there, Chris. You're right. Oh, there's plenty coming in. I'm just waiting for the right right time opportunity for okay. you, Stephen. Um, here's so a here's an interesting one. So I was living in. People will, might might know. I spent the best part of 20 years traveling back and forth between Australia and and uh, and, and Fiji, uh, working Pacific Games squads and and coaching over there. And uh, I was living on this island for six months, a uh, very good friend of mine, Colin Philp, who's who manages it. And uh, it's my bolt hole if I ever want to get back there to a place in the sun. And uh, these guys, you know, they were living on the island working and they just talk, used to talk, talk to me about standing. They saw stand up paddleboarding come to the island. They said, oh, yeah, we see our old our grandfather standing and paddling canoes. And I said, well, OK, let's get you guys together. Let's go and have a go. So I got these guys together and we put them in a canoe and we just thought, well, let's see what can happen. And uh, this is what happened. And you've got to bear in mind, some of these guys have basically never paddled before. So this is kind of an interesting experiment. I'm steering at the back. So uh, if you can put it in context. <clears throat> I have a... Sorry, Chris. I'll, I'll ask a question in a minute. Okay. And I've, I've spoken about how primal a thing paddling is, you know, and th these guys basically just going purely on instinct, you know, swing the paddle, stick it in and pull. I mean, yeah, there's nothing going on here. They, they don't know any about, they don't care about science, mechanics, they're just getting on with it, you know. And uh, I just thought it was the most brilliant thing that I'd ever done. It was absolutely, <laughs> it was this was wicked. <laughs> and they loved that's, it. That's fantastic, Steve. Um, have you noticed Islanders moving um, towards SUP and have they embraced it or the OC world is still obviously dominant but have a lot of them actually moved towards uh, SUP and using it as a cross training tool? Yeah I mean at the, yes and we'll get to those cross training ideas later but yes absolutely I mean a lot of the guys that are paddling in Tahiti for example the ones that are paddling but are the V1s at a high level and V6s they do comprehend the idea that you know standing and paddling is very very good for them because they spend their whole life sitting uh, if you sit and paddle, uh, you know, there are just muscle groups that are not being worked like they should. So, you know, it's a bit like you go to the gym because you want to sort of do some pushing exercises, but you spend your whole life pulling. Um, so you try to balance your body out. So in this way, if you do stand up, then you start to use you know, parts of the body that you hadn't, you're not really using. And so absolutely, if it's going to make, Taishans will do anything, they'll do anything that's going to make them faster paddles. They're going to go faster in the canoe, they'll do it. And what I would say in very strong terms is that if you can paddle an OC1, you'll become a better stand up paddle water too. So, uh, you know, that's why it's important to understand the cross flow is benefits for both parties. This isn't about me selling you out of your canoeing, it's also about the benefits going both ways. You know, for our canoeists, for them to go to stand up is also very beneficial. Yeah, so there's you know, the, the biggest problem, Chris, in the islands, of course, is affordability because all these guys don't have a lot of lot of money, so they have to rely on uh, sponsorship or uh, you know benefit, benefactors in, in, in the system. But uh, if they could have one, they absolutely would. Yeah. Okay. Like you say, affordability is a big issue there, Steve, isn't it? Um, yeah. 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 It's all right. Keep going. 
Yep, keep going. Yep, great. Yep, so <clears throat> I'm just sort of moving on now to the solo canoes. So, I mean, obviously in the islands, in all through the islands to the Pacific, I mean, they, they use these single canoes for, for fishing and all sorts. And of course, it, it was no surprise often they would come around to designing something for, for racing, which sort of happened, you know, our best part of, I don't know, I suppose it wasn't until about the, they were racing them in the, in, you know, in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, they were racing variants of canoes, but they were never really serious. And it took them some years before they got to a point where they said, let's get serious and start making proper, uh, proper canoes for racing. And um, <clears throat> this is a far more modern one, but you know, through the 60s, as things started to pick up, with people were getting more serious in the 70s, and by the 80s, things were getting more and more serious and full blown. And by the 90s, things were just, you know, skyrocketing in terms of technology. Now, this is a rudderless, a rudderless canoe. There's no rudder system in this whatsoever. So it relies purely on the, the, the skill of the paddler to steer it with a paddle. They've got to paddle fast and straight, um, and that is a big ask. And you have to learn this, this, this art. And... Within our, without, without really canoeing circles, being able to paddle a va'a hoi, as they're called, a hoi means a paddle and va'a is the canoe. Mm -hmm. To paddle a va'a hoi, you know, well, um, is the pinnacle. It's the hardest thing to do. It, it's probably, it, well, it's harder than steering a sailing canoe. I mean, learning how to paddle one of these things is really phenomenally difficult. And once, but once you master it, you know, you, you master your own domain, you can pretty much handle anything because it really is quite tricky. <clears throat> Having said that, it's not so difficult, you can't do it. But you have to be, in a sense, shown. And I, I was amazed to see, you know, you see four and five year olds in Tahiti paddling these, and they're learning. They're learning really early, you know. It's a bit like if you want to be a really good C1 paddler, you need to start early because the thing, or even K1, the earlier you can start, the better because they're so tippy. These are difficult for other for a different reason. They're, they're they're difficult because they're so unreliable in terms of which way they're going to go, left or right. <laughs> they're they're affected by wind, affected by current, affected by the, by waves. So bringing all these skill sets of how to steer them is, is really essential. And you can't steer this like you would steer a Canadian canoe. Completely different because you're sitting right smack in the middle of the thing, <clears throat> and you've got this, this big drag that's hanging out to the left of you. So you're constantly having to fight that. So it is a, a, a massive art form to learn one of these things. So consequently, we, you know, the, and these came before the, the rudded versions, the rudded versions didn't start happening until sort of in the, in the 80s, but that's just a, you know, something for you to, to be aware of. Um, <clears throat> so I say steering, so I mean, you're paddling and then having to do these, these spooky steering strokes, which, you know, really are uh, something that you have, to, um, you have to learn, you know, the hard way. And the prop, one of the things about paddling outrig is just a bit like stand up. I mean, with stand up paddle boarding and without an outrigger, if you just paddle, you know, this in one way, you're just doing this, this, you're just going the one way, left and right, left and right, which you can do on an OC1, you can do it on the, in a six man canoe, you can do it on a stand up paddle board. Of course, <clears throat> where it becomes tricky is where you've got to put in steering strokes. Now, you need that on, you have to do that on the stand up paddle board, you have to bring in steering strokes. But I think a lot of people are quite weak on that. They're not putting in the, learning, adding in uh, correctional strokes on a stand-up part of water is something that people are quite weak at, basically what I'm trying to get get, get through, um, and not something that's necessarily practice enough. They'll just say, oh, wind's from the left, I'll paddle on the right, or whatever, you know, so they, that, that's about as good as it gets, but really there's a lot more to it, and position, fee positions are critical. <clears throat> But for me, paddling this, I mean, for example, I have to, I mean, I've been paddling these for about 15, 20 years, and I'm not, nowhere near an expert uh, like the Haitians are. But, you know, one thing I notice is that you see how my body's really twisted there. I mean, that, that hurts. It hurts if, you, it hurts if, you, if, you, if you're used to going one way and all of a sudden you start doing this sort of thing or that sort of thing. It's like it really starts to challenge you on another level. Um, and one of the things you notice about the Tahitians is how incredibly flexible they are on these. They're like gymnasts. They're paddling like a gymnast. It's just the, their ability to... To, to talk their body and twist it into weird shapes to get the thing to do what it needs to do. Uh, and and, the, and a lot of the better paddlers are, are a lot of them are quite sk they're skinny and they're quite tall and they've got long levers and they're not overly muscled. You know, uh, when you paddle big six man canoes all the time in, in, in the way that we, that I certainly have and one man's, it can certainly bulk you up, but uh, it's a different, it's a different thing altogether when you paddle one of these canoes. Um, 
just some variations of steering strokes here, what you, what you need to do. So you sort of bring in push away strokes at the end. And uh, some of these strokes, fortunately, you can learn in the six man can then apply them to the, to the V1. But again, it's uh, your reaction time. You have to be so ahead of the curve. You have to predict what the canoe, what the canoe is going to do even before it's done it. Because by the time it's you know, decided to do it, you're still thinking about it. It's too late. So, and that itself is a real art and a real skill to, um, to sort of uh, to, to, to master. So an amazing challenge. But when you get it right, though, what a beautiful piece of kit it is. It's glorious. It just, it's going along rails. It's smooth. It's sweet. You know, again, get on Google, have a look. You know, you'll see these guys, how they just uh, get so much speed out of these things. They make it look like a dance, an art, an art form. Yeah, it's just superb. <clears throat> If you had a preference, Steve, sorry, rudderless or or rudder, your own personal choice, what 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 would you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, yeah, that's kind of like a <clears throat> it's almost like a holy grail question, that one. Um, yeah, look, it's it's it, I don't know, if it's, maybe it's, it's almost like asking between shoreboard and longboard and surfing, or uh, maybe it's maybe it's not. I'm not sure, but um, look, the thing is, um, I. I really, really love the challenge of the V1. I think that, you know, at, when you get to a certain level of paddling, having the, v, mastering the V1 is really critical. It depends where I am. It, when, when I'm in the waters in England, you know, I've got to say an OC1 just, just works better. Uh, why? Because the waters are cold, they're unpredictable, big currents, it's gnarly at times. You know, you, can, you need a point and shoot sort of thing when you need the safety of the, of the rudder. Um, you've got to remember, Geographically, in terms of where these canoes are being are being used, I mean, they're being used where often there's tray winds and things are a little bit uh, more more um, you know uh, sort of sort of uh, pleasant. I suppose is probably a good word for it. Um, whereas, and of course, they they are sit inside. They sit inside so that if you were to capsize, you've got the issues of bailing and all that sort of stuff. All that stuff. So. And they were a lot of these guys spend hours and hours and hours training inside the lagoon before they get outside the reef, which is also another luxury. Whereas, you know, with an OC1, if you don't have the luxury of reefs, sorry, with a, sorry, if you, sorry, if you live in a country where there are no reefs and you need to start learning, then an OC1 gives you that safety, that safety uh, sort of cover with, with the, you know, with, with the rudder. So, and then you can, once you've got those skills, just the basic skills of having learning the armor and the, the nuances of that, you can drop the you, a lot of the one man canoes. You can just get yourself a, a spanner and drop the um, drop the rudder out of it, and then just practice. I mean, some of them don't work so well, but some do. Which kind of brings me to this. You know, this is actually is a K. This is a K one. It's, it's a T. Sorry, TK one. It's probably a touring a touring uh, kayak. And uh, this is in London. And these guys in London, the dragon boat dudes, have been doing this for years. I mean, like, when I say years, I mean literally years. It's probably maybe since the 80s. You know, <clears throat> you could get yourself a TK one like that and just bolt on some some uh, some iakus, the the, 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 the the spreaders there, and make up a little armor, the float, uh, and paddle it with a single paddle. So I mean. It's creative thinking. It's a novel idea, but it works. But it gives you gives you an idea, and again, you could drop the fin out of that. So, you know, it, it gives gives you the option. Um, yeah, it, it, interesting question. I mean, look, the difference really though between the two craft is one is you muscle your way through everything. The OC one is all about muscling your way, muscle, muscle, muscle. You know, it's just you can power up wind, smash up wind, smash cross wind. You can do all that stuff. A V one's not like that. You got to stroke it. You got to be really gentle with it. You can't you can't lean forward and start smashing it up, 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 up the front because you move your center of effort ahead of the the pivot point, and then you start pushing the canoe off in all the wrong areas. So it's a really delicate uh, female thing. Whereas I think the OC one is more of a male thing. It's more more of a it's a blunt instrument. The OC one, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's just a surf ski with a, an arm, right? Really. Um, but the V1 is definitely a precision instrument. <laughs> so it requires precision paddling. So, you know, there, there's the difference, I think. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Steve. Yeah, so here we have, um, you know, this is, uh, we had the development of, we, we started moving into one-man outrigger canoes and they were developed, uh, basically they took these one-man rudderless canoes from Tahiti, they brought them into Hawaii, started tinkering with them and adding uh, uh, the steering mechanism. It took them several, probably five, maybe five years to sort of really figure it out to start getting anywhere. 
And uh, it, uh, it just took off like a rocket. I mean, it made sense. I mean, in the off season in Hawaii, when uh, everyone downs tools from the, from the, from the six man season, now they've got an option to, to jump on the, the one man's. And, you know, this is a multi-million dollar industry. I mean, you know, every man is dog wants one, has one, needs one. You know, if you want to be in a, an OC6 crew, uh, you've got to have one of these because you're going to be doing time trials. And if you're not in time trials, you're not in a, going to be in a six man canoe. So it's uh, became a necessary accessory. So which kind of makes it interesting to consider because, you know, they're forcing you to go out and spend three and a half, four thousand US dollars to get involved in the sport uh, that you maybe you don't want to. But actually, you have to. You've got no choice. But once you do you're addicted and you can't help yourself. And they've created races for it. Molokai obviously is there and other race series. So it's indicative of, of the sport. You've got to be, you've got to start embracing it all if you want to sort of get anywhere competitively. Um, it also is a great way to see just how you're going mano a mano, you know, one-on-one, how, how, how you, know, you, t- you, you can talk yourself up in a six man, but it's not to you actually sit down and, and put yourself on the, on the line on a one man to see how just well you're, how well you're really going. Um, so again, coming back to stand up, you know, this, this is something to really consider, you know, <laughs> if you're a really ruthless coach, you know, if I, if you had, if I had a team of girls and guys, I was working, I'd say, right, go and buy one man canoes and, or, or rather, you know, our club's going to buy a couple of these, you're going to train in these and you're going to train on the, on the subs and we're going to mix it all up and we're going to get you doing other stuff, you know, um, why? Because of all the reasons I was saying before, you know, biomechanically, and from the, phys- from the ph- uh, physiological point of view, it's all beneficial. Uh, when you're sitting, you know, you can see the bumps and runners better. You get a feel for things better. And then when you stand up, it all kind of begins to make a bit better sense. And, you know, you really can learn your paddle skills sitting down without the, the, the sort of uh, the balance issues so much. You're not freaking out. You know, get, get your paddling skills sorted, then stand up. Rather than jump on and have to figure out balance as well as paddling all at the same time. So many many benefits you know re- they really are so um you know both sports are equally uh, have equal things to offer but it's just um you know, someone's approach to to how they're going to sort of you know their their paddle sports lifestyle if you like embracing these other sports um <clears throat> here's a little clip this is just me once again in feed just a short one just want to look at the volume. You know, when you're paddling a one-man outrigger, you get the volume. You're gonna, you can just knock out the miles, and you can get high stroke rates. And it's just, it's just kind of easy. Uh, you know, you you look, you build up a big aerobic threshold doing this, and uh, something you can take into, um, in, into paddle, into into sup. And always keep in mind with paddle sports, it's actually very hard to get, get your heart rate that high. So you know, as much as this is, you know, you're working quite hard. And actually, I'm not even working that hard to be fair in this one, but. Um, for example, you, um, you're still better off running up flight of stairs and <laughs> getting on a bike running up a hill to get your heart rate sorted because actually, uh, you, you know, you, if you put a heart rate monitor on yourself, you'd be amazed just how off uh, max you would be. Um, so here we go. Our rating is still slow, but you know, you can go up a lot higher than that. You'll note the speed as I go around a little marker in a moment. Of course, yeah, you got the rudder, so you know it's a no-brainer. It's just little little poke on the on the on the foot pedal, and poof, you're off where you need to go. So happy days, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, the point is you're getting this volume of work. You know, you're putting in, you're putting these miles and miles of training in, you know, and then when you go to your stand-up, you've got that, you've got it there, and uh, also it's from an injury point of view, you know, you can, you can, you can minimize injury when you're sitting down to some degree, stand up again, there are potential, potentially a few more injury issues you could have. So this is quite a good way to do, to do a lot more training and perhaps narrow down the, 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 the um, potential for any injury. So um, that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, well, I'm getting to more nitty gritty sort of stuff now. The evolution of padding techniques. Now I'll talk about outrigger, but we're going to we're going to stand up very soon. Um, you get you get a feel for it. So, like like everything, look, 
it's really important to understand paddling techniques are absolutely profoundly affected by paddle designs. If you come up with a new paddle design, then you have to change your technique. And, you know, and everyone, it's a morphology. Everything has to morph and, and, and sort of go together. And uh, this is why paddles are absolutely critical. They're not an afterthought. They're not a secondary consideration. They are the most, they are the, the primary primo thing you will purchase beyond any other consideration of your board. You must, must get it right. It can be holding you back like you would never believe. You don't even know it. And most, a lot of folks are going to get a chance to, they might, oh, that's nice. I'll buy that. It's a pretty color and I'll, whatever it might be. And you, you go down that pathway. And then a few years later, some hands you say, hey, you've tried this. And they go, oh my God, I just don't realize these things existed. But then you still have to change your paddling stroke to, to an extent. But you know, all these paddles, and look at that. There's a pile of paddles being, this is in Tahiti. I mean, stacks just, you know, you go into these factories, they're just churning them out in the thousands. So this is all used in timber of course um you know making paddles i've made quite a few of my own paddles it's quite normal to make your own paddles you know really you have to have a crack at it you know um something bespoke for yourself especially for steering more for steering than it is for the, the paddler but for steering it's nice to make your own stick bamboo laminates all that sort of stuff using hibiscus uh, mangrove woods which are very light and kind of funky and um, that's the sort of stuff that we background we've come from. But of course, then carbon is what is the world we live in, but the stand up uh, in particular. And why not? Because it's a lends itself fantastic to the sport, mainly because of the weight. As long as you're building some flex to the to the to the shaft, but uh, you don't want an iron bar, but you want to look at that again. That depends on a whole bunch of issues for yourself, uh, whether you've got pre existing injuries or not. Um, and just how you again, how you how you feel you know but the paddle's got to talk to you if it's not talking to you it's already wrong it's got to be telling you positive things if it's telling you nothing worry if it's telling you I you know, it's horrible then get rid of it if it's telling you happy so happy thoughts and making you feel good well that's absolutely fine yeah. stay with it but it won't be good for you in all situations and that is why having a few is important single bend paddling technique all this is applies to argo but again it all applies again to um you know, no less to, to, um, to stand up out of warning and, uh, the, all the phases, the entry catch power phase and the, the rotational vertical set phase, the exit and the recoveries. They're all part of the, um, things again, we're all used to. And again, I just put this in here to show, you, you know, we're, we're books that I write. So I've got books on, this is OC paddling OC ones, paddling V ones. So all these books that I've been doing during my lifetime, but you know, the mechanics are all there. It's all similar. I mean, you just got to just got to take translate it into standing up and how it, how it, how it, how it uh, how it changes. So again, you know, this is where these aria guys are coming in and already kind of already have that knowledge. And again, if you if you're a stand up paddle and you want to get into aria canoeing, you know the benefits are huge because you can really you can really think out your paddling stroke. And yes, you're going to have to modify a little bit when you stand up for sure. But at the end of the day, the principles remain the same. And you know. People generally don't understand what the setup is. What is it? What should you look like? What should you feel like here? What's the energy at that point going to feel like when you move through into the you know, from entry, uh, moving down into the entry? You know, what does that feel like? What are you trying to do? You're trying to use body weight, not use body weight. Where should you all? Where should you be in terms of your body? Um, the catch what is that exactly you know, what does it mean what, what what is the blade doing at that point what is the water doing what are the water particles doing what what are you, what are you trying to push the ocean backwards are you trying to hold water what what exactly does that mean um moving into the pull phase you know what, how do you translate that from the body through all the systems of your feet to your hips through the arms and shoulders down the arm down the shaft into the blade well, how do you how do you achieve that how do you maintain form can I just interject there, Steve? Because yeah. um, for, all, for all those that are listening, we, we, we should have quite a lot of the answers to those questions because we've got a, a fantastic um, development session coming up uh, scheduled with Steve to talk exactly about those things that he's just mentioned. And we'll, that will be on a Wednesday. That, so we're all going to be really looking forward to that one. And um, if I'll just make a backward step a minute, um, Steve, while we were talking about paddlers, uh, paddles, um, do you think that the OC paddle manufacturers in general, given their history, make better sup paddles? Uh, not necessarily. And I think the reason I would say not necessarily is because I think they're probably a bit myopic. And I don't mean that in a neg negative way. I know that they're making, they're still, you know, they're still reliant on um, 
you know the the industry that they're in from the supply of sails rather to you know canoeists uh, who are paddling rivers who are paddling dragon boats who are paddling outrigger canoeists and actually the sub market as big as it is um i suspect it's not as big as you think it is in terms of their sales because you know it's quite a fractured market i mean not, not everyone has the same principle of wanting to spend a lot of money they don't want to spend 300 400 pounds on a paddle they just go whoa no way and yet my view is if it was a thousand pounds buy it it is the best things in sliced bread because it's still the tool it's the only tool you have the board is not a tool this is a you know it's an instrument um, but it better be damn good for that money, obviously. <laughs> um, a crazy story. You know, it, it's not even a moving part. I mean, windsurfing, you can spend nearly a thousand pounds on a fin for crying out loud. I mean, and people do it. I mean, that it really is kind of like, it really is a dark art anyway. But yes, I think, look, um, if I reckon if a, if a stand up, if, if a company's opened up and they purely dealt in stand up, stand up paddles and they had never come from an outrigger background, I have no, no problem in thinking they could do it, they could do as good a job, if not better. If they weren't, if they just really looked at stand up paddle boarding all the mechanics. And I don't believe that's really what's going on because I, I don't, I'm not convinced that we have the correct paddle yet. And I think, that, you know, I've been banging on about this for a while, but, um, oh, there's so many paddles around me. I showed them last week, you know. Uh, well, you know, for example, you know, I mean, I mean, this was a, David make Chun love the guys and they're absolutely they're, they're legends, you know, and they, they make fantastic super paddles, you know, but this is one of their early, early sub paddles. And it was basically literally was just an outrigger paddle and just, you know, extended the shaft. That was it. And we used it. And that's, that's all went on for quite a long, long time. And, you know, I, things come out like paddles or V shapes and funny little V's and that's and golf ball dimples and a bajillion things. But, Fundamentally, what seems to be wrong is the shape, you know, because we keep on going back to these basic teardrop shapes, which is very, a teardrop has a very low center of effort. And, you know, because you're standing up, you kind of need one that's very long. You don't, this sort of short, dumpy thing does, it's, I just don't think it's the, the way to go because, you know, when you're sitting down, you can get away with something quite stumpy. You know, you've got, you're right there near it, you can get a lot of power. Your lever arm is so low, so short, you can, you can deal with it. But when you're standing up, it's a completely different world. You've got a very long, you know, I think this long, the idea of having something longer with your center of effort being much higher and you can actually determine how much of that blade you use. I think that's not such a bad idea. I have no idea what hasn't really been attempted yet. Um, I, I might have to attempt it, <laughs> but yes, good question. Yeah, we, well, we, we have some more coming in, but um, I'll, if you, um, we'll ask them at the, towards the end of the, of the uh, presentation if that's okay steve yeah absolutely fine um yeah so here i've got you know um this window look, look at the triangle okay that triangle as you move through the stroke it's it remains you know what i mean it remains it doesn't break it stays there yeah that's that's really interesting i mean th th these are things that you can practice and get to learn and this is why video videoing yourself is so key once you get videoed you know you'll go oh that's why I get it now because you think you're doing it, but actually you're not, you, you know, that, and it's really important to, to be shown, you know, what exactly is going on for you. Um, here we are doing, uh, this is another picture of me say showing you, so the distance from my lower hand to the center of effort, uh, the widest point on the blade, you can see how short it is, you know, so I'm saying here up when you, know, you choke down, so you get a bit more control over the blade, you rely more on power here than leverage because leverage is, one thing you need to understand about a paddle, I mean, it's just that it's, it's the, the paddle is a great tool as a lever. The problem is that, that we have no fixed fulcrum point. We are very frail. Our hand moves all over the place. You can, it's not ratcheting off of anything that's like a, a rowing rollock. You know, that lower hand is just all over the bloody place. And because it is, you know, the idea of using it as a first class lever or a second class lever is just a nonsense. And this is why you have to find somewhere in between. This is why rotation becomes so important because you've got to, you actually got to move, uh, you've got to move yourself through the water using a different sort of mindset. This is why pushing forward with the top hand doesn't work. Um, again, that'll be a first class lever. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff there that you need to understand. But again, we can do that on Wednesday. I don't want to sort of break, break stuff like that down. Um, so, but again, you can. The great thing about being on the, these canoes is you've got you can you can spend twice as much time on the water 
do twice as many miles for half the pain almost you know so you can sort of put yourself through these these miles then stand up on your on your stand up and go okay i feel myself now becoming a paddler and by that what do i mean by that because you're really becoming intimate with 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 the paddle and the mechanics of everything and this is what the beauty of being able to sit down and really think it out and then when you stand up you can really start to micromanage things a lot better because you're sitting down paddling here you're not stressed about your balance um again classic you know here's a photo i mean look at the, the just the window there that you need to create you know i i i rarely get filmed but every now and then i do i go oh that's terrible all that's good you know just i have good and bad sort of months and lately i've been going out uh, you know up until the, the virus thing when i was sort of working very much on you know getting my form back because i had a condition i had to deal with and you know i'm trying to sort of really go back and focus on the key things which are important to to especially as getting older to be more and more and more efficient as a paddler you just have to be because you know aerobically you get you get, you get a bit you know not so good as you used to be um so you know that you learn things so when you're wondering on what my man can you learn about water particles revolving you know when you're trying to chase bump runners and bumps then you know you know, knowing at what, what section of the wave you are, are the water particles working with you or working against you? And if you're on a very long craft, like an outrows, uh, an OC one's around 21 foot long, you've got water particles revolving one way on one section of the canoe and another way at another section and so on. So you've got to know, know about that. Now, what's important to know about this is that if you're paddling an Astarot paddleboard, it's exactly the same. If you're on a 12, 6, 14, 16 foot, 18 foot board, or wherever it might be, you're doing downwinds, you know, knowing about these sections of the waves and where the water particles are working, when they're against you or, you know, with you, you know, then you'll know when to push and when to back off. Sometimes you're, you're ripping the skin off it thinking, yeah, 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 bah, 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 and pff, nothing's happening. And, you know, at that point, you know that actually you're in a really bad part of the wave. You should just back off. It's just wasting your time. You're spinning the wheels. You've got to wait to get that, you know, until things are working for you. So again, all those mechanics of the, of the, of the way waves are working, um, again, you're just sitting down and doing this in a canoe is just easier. I, mean, I, I couldn't imagine my life starting standing up and having to figure it all out. You know, it's, it's really difficult. Um, so the, the, the positives are absolutely there in learning, uh, in, in learning the mechanics of, of how to use the paddle when to swap sides and this is the beauty about our canoeing you, you you're swapping you're going left right left right you you're not sitting there counting you're not going nine ten you'll better change now you know you just you literally a bit like stout you change when you want to change on an oc1 you've got the luxury of course with the rudder you can go for as long as you want if on one side or the other side as you wish you're not going to be bullied by the by the elements on a stand-up, you really are bullied by the elements, even much more so. Uh, and, and of course, without the rudder system, if you have a rudder system, that's another advantage having a rudder system in a, in a SUP. If you had one, it'd be brilliant because you could actually you know, get that luxury going left and right as you want, rather than having to um, you know, be, be on one side the whole way and put all these compensation strokes in. So again, you know, that's one of the benefits of the OC1. The V1, again, you know, you could do all of this in the right environment, but um, you know, it's not the place to start generally because it's definitely the high end of the spectrum. Um, St Steve, um, a question coming in. You, you just mentioned about uh, learning, learning the the techniques and the nuances of um, OC one. Um, where actually in the UK can people who have an interest in possibly taking this up? Where, where actually are there places available now for people to? experiment and get some lessons um mm. i know with our symposium that we're having in october we'll have ryan and yourself will be there and we're hoping to offer it but you know if we're allowed to get on the water before and people want to have a go um can they come and see you on uh, hailing island um yeah, yeah absolutely i've got yeah you know, i have two two oc ones here and uh, i'll be more than happy to uh to have folks come down and and um you know get them out on the water i mean to I've said so I've got two, so realistically, I could if two people wanted to come down, I could take them out. You know, I could be on a stand up, or I've got a I can go on my kayak, uh, whatever. But, um, and that's that's a really, and of course, this is the real issue. I mean, you know, where do people get this uh, this water time? Well, absolutely, come and see me. Give Ryan, perhaps contact Ryan James, or 
uh, he would be able to probably steer in the right direction and help you out. Uh, he could come down and we could do one together. Um, but the more canoes we can grab and get into one spot, you know, I, I think that would be, that would be excellent. Um, in terms of supply and demand, I mean, look, you know, the secondhand market is very weak in this country. The, the nearest place to go to consider is France. There are, there is a secondhand market there and they, and they do manufacture them there. Um, what we really need in this country is a manufacturer. Ultimately, we need to be making them here so that we can then, you know, take the sport to another, to another sort, of, sort of phase of development. Um, you need a second-hand market, obviously, because that's where, you know, the buy-in is important. You know, I, I, I think my, my first canoe here I bought, uh, I got it for pretty much like a cost price. And the second one I'm, I got second-hand for about £1,600. And, uh, you know, £1,600, and think about that, it's £1,600. This thing is 21 foot long. The hull it, itself, carbon fibre, vacuum bag, pre-impregnated uh, pre -impregnated carbon, carbon fibre, uh hollow and it weighs about seven and a half eight kilos 21 foot long and yeah. the thing is bulletproof you know i mean and it's got moving parts and it, and a new probably would have been three and a half thousand maybe just under four grand now you think oh that's a lot of money but you know what the tech in it is incredible and it will last forever it lasts i mean i've got one canoe that's lasted me no it must be must be pushing 10 years old and the other one's probably seven eight years old and to be fair, a good buffing, buffing out and they look as good as new. And they do last a very, very long time. And, um, you know, you get to use them an awful lot. And Ryan James and I have this conversation all the time. I mean, Ryan is a guy who's, what, five-time, six-time, five-time? Five-time champion, the national champion in this country. And, you know, I think it was the first year or two years he wasn't paddling. And he, and he saw me one day and he's paddling. He, we were mates. He said, oh, can I have a go? Yeah, Ryan, have a go. And he had another go another time and suddenly he was hooked. He said, man, I've got, I've got to do this. And he started re doing the research and seeing everyone else was doing it. You know, the Travis Grants, this world and, the, and others and the Danny Chings. I want to be, I want a piece of this. I want to get involved. And, you know, he's uh, had to, he's managed to get a canoe here in England. Then he, I think he ultimately drove to France and picked one up, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's what you do for an obsession. And, um, you know, uh, but it's improved his, his paddling ability out of sight. You know, he's made this genuinely made him into a paddler. He just totally appreciates and he gets it, you know, he's gone to another level. And, um, and of course he can do the volume. Yeah. Well, there is a supplier, I believe in Cardiff, Jenny Thames, uh, canoe. Um, I think what we'll do Steve for the audience yeah. is, um, we, we'll have a little chat after this and see if we can, um, get together and maybe arrange some, uh, intro sessions for those that are interested and, and we'll post this for our social media so for all the audience listening if you if you are interested in that um give us a couple of days to try and coordinate everything but it'd be great to get for you to get up and have a session with steve and ryan so look yeah, out on I mean, our channels yeah it'd be excellent i'd, I'd you know I'd, 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 I'd dearly love to get that that, that that sport happening in this country more more um, more aggressively and um, but it's going to take you know, taster sessions and some skill-based sessions and then taking people out for sessions and downwinds and things like that and other, other conditions. And then, then I'll understand the mechanics and build build confidence. But yeah, and then we can look at where we can supply, get us, you know, what we used to do in Australia is we used to literally order a container. We'd order a container uh, from the Far East and we'd get, get orders to pre-order. We'd get pre-orders. So you'd pre-order, you know, uh, as many as 20 30 canoes and just fill out a whole container and bring them over <laughs> you know? um, yeah maybe maybe one idea steve is and i don't know if this is happening already but um maybe the oc and sup events could be run together to encourage a crossover and awareness because mm. the um paddle events are really really popular as we know um, so, yeah. um to, if we could get some oc ones there as well um be a great way wouldn't it to expose expose this uh wonderful sport to stand up paddle building brigade well and of course you know in, in america that's in hawaii and places that that's been going on for some years now they combine the ocs and the subs together because and, and they really do it because guys turn up to events they've got they've got an hour rigger and they've got a sup and so they 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 end up doing both events and um you know, it's just more meat on the bone for, for people to get to get involved with, you know, and more bang for, bang for their buck. They go to an event, they get to get, get not just to get one event, they get to get two or three or four, you know, they get the other variety there. And then they can they compare themselves with their mates and they become part of a, 
so become part of something bigger, you know, you know, more, more ex expansive. And that's, that's, that's a fantastic thing. And coming to that, you know, here's Travis Grant, all time photograph, you know, and uh, this is Travis Grant winning Molokai on that absolutely epic wave. And, uh, you know, I, I, he's, I was speaking to him last week. I mean, he's just such a top guy and he's got such a casual approach to stuff, you know, and he's got these water-based skills all over the place. Started out in Surski, went to Outrigger, uh, moved to Hawaii that could, from Australia and then just got involved by accident in, in, in stand-up like a lot of these guys did. Um, and to be fair, I mean, it was, there was at the time, there is, there's more money in this than there is in Outrigger. I mean, they, they, these guys are getting paid um, where, though he's still got, he doesn't do it he has another job as well but the point is some guys very few obviously were paid an income but in our regard that doesn't exist and um maybe that's why it's been so i don't know it's a friendly sport <laughs> what i mean by that well sup can be a bit i think because it has a lot of sort of uh what's the word just um growing up sort of tantrum problems at times you know i think that whereas our rig is obviously mature it's been going what nearly 100 years now to, to in many well competitively started 1922 as a first regatta first uh, formalized regatta in hawaii so what 2020 now so it's 100 years um so yeah we've got a long way to go in standard powder warning and you know it's no no wonder we're having teething issues to to, to work through um but what a great um, photo oh it's a magical photo steve um I, i'm not quite sure how uh, long how much longer your presentation wants to it's going to go on for um yeah i could probably I've, I've, i mean it's fantastic keep going <laughs> if the, the audience is you know saying keep going it's it's fantastic we've got some questions coming through so um i'm, I'm not yeah. sure whether you want me to uh interject with those now or wait well, for I'll, give, I'll, I'll try and bash through this quickly and then we'll um yeah then we're going to have the questions Does that sound okay yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I'll try and move a little quicker, then we can get through. Uh, this is a picture of Travis Grant. Travis is steering there. He's just steering a six-man canoe. This is like 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. I, this is me with photographing him. Um, you know, so I guess he would have been not much more than harsh. No, he would have been 20-something, so he's, you know, where's he now? I don't know if I know how Travis is. He's not 40 yet, but he's, he's getting there. But anyway, it gives you an idea of, you know, just uh, this is sort of background. He's paddling, paddling one man's. This is us just paddling. This is just, uh, this is Travis. Uh, first time ever in a sailing canoe. This is in England. He came to visit me. This is in June, uh, a couple of years back. And then, uh, and then in July, I went one Molokai on the, on the, uh, on the stand up. Um, yeah, there's just an old shot of people. Uh, this is me just doing some downwinds, not that interesting. That's uh, doing uh, the uh, paddling uh, downwind on the in outrigger. So that's downwind on stuff and downwind in, on the OC1. So it's all, to me, it's all kind of the same thing. Uh, the mechanics are pretty much the same. Uh, this is something I was talking about before. We have this long lever. I've got a much greater distance between that lower hand all the way down to the center of effort of the blade. And that's where you know that's what really takes sucks the life out of you in, in, in stand up so you can they again you need to this is why we have to understand the tool we're using as a lever and we need to understand first class levers and second class levers to understand what is we're actually doing because actually not it's not it's neither of those it's somewhere in between there's a there's a very good reason for it which i can so i'll try and cover on wednesday on wednesday the wednesday sessions but um you know it's uh it's extraordinarily hard on the body um again that's not a great reason about outrigger it's, it's a bit it's a bit more kind um again just some stuff from from my book actually but you know I, this idea of padding statically and dynamically very important to understand is statically is where there's not not so much impetus in terms of throwing your body weight into it whereas dynamic you are and again that's something you can practice in in, in stand up um and um it's really important to understand those those two um two aspects of the standard paddle boarding um, here's the saying, you know, non-fixed fulcrum in the area of your hand, your lower hand up and uh, pushing and low at the bottom. So pushing forward is not a good thing. Again, I can explain that in more detail at some point. But again, you, you learn all this in outrigger canoeing. Uh, it's just downwinding, Travis. Um, so all, all the aspects are all the same thing they are in, in outrigger. This is something I did years ago. This is just me uh, superimposing two pictures on each other. So I've got... Uh, 
one of his mini standing up, the other one sitting in the canoe, where you can see their paddle angles are all pretty much the same. Again, the same thing, standing. And see Steve, one that. Yes. Uh, sorry to interject. Um, the images that you're showing us here, these are all taken from uh, your, a variety of your books. Yeah. Um, that you have, and um, you know, with, with, without the uh, without the need to plug, um, it would be great if you could just tell the audience right now um, where the books are. How how do we get these books? Um, how can people purchase them? Um, yeah, well, all, all all of the books they come from. Um, canoeculture.com which is uh, you can see it down there the tag which is www.canoeculture which is k-a-n-u-c-u-l-t-u-r-e.com canoe culture so all all the books are available there so you've got books about all aspects of the sport i mean the stand-up book is that one which some people are familiar with um it you know really is a bible it's 500 pages we've got to remember this there's five years to write and that's i keep telling people you know this, this isn't the gospel according to me this is you know it's, it, a lot of input from some great great people to make to make that happen so um you know i think it's great bedtime reading and a reference point and if you're confused this should help <laughs> basically um but if you're and if you're in the industry too like if you're certainly in coaching and, and doing workshops and you're doing uh, pilates things with or your sup yoga whatever you're into i mean racing this this book is you know the, the standard palace guide will certainly help in that respect um, again, you know, with my books, you know, I've been an educator all my life and I write the books with absolute passion and I do it for purely to, because I so want other people to paddle better and get more out of this, more out of their sport. And because the moment you start having, you know, sort of revelations and you move to another level and then another revelation, you move forward. That's what keeps you kind of coming back from what gets you out of bed in the morning. Because I hate people just sort of walk you away from paddle sports because they go, oh, I just you know, don't get it, don't like it, I'm bored or whatever. But you know, so reading a book like that will make sure you don't get bored. Trust me. <laughs> um, C1 paddling. I mean, I just briefly mentioned this. I mean, there are guys who are coaching and, and pushing uh, their their sort of uh, philosophy on stand up, and that's absolutely fine. The only the only caveat I'll put on it because a lot of these uh, C1 is you know it's, it's profoundly different on some levels. Uh, primarily they're 500 meters, 1,000 meters, they're, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a flat water sport, they're on one side, I mean, it's, it's you're not going to go out and buy a C1 for, for giggles, because, I mean, the, these are instruments to torture, they are hard, hard, one. I have absolute respect for them, but don't get me wrong, the, the, this is mega, mega hard stuff, paddling this stuff, paddling these C1s, the micromanagement issues are just immense. Um, but it is still profoundly different. And of course, you know, the limitations are it's not an ocean sport. You're not paying left to right. And there are limits. Uh, whereas, you know, paddlers from our real backgrounds come from the hard school of hard knocks. They deal with crazy elements and mega distances. And uh, so their training philosophies are completely, completely different. Uh, so it's just worth keeping that in mind, again, in terms of where you're sourcing information from. Foot positions, again, you know, this is the mate. This, you know, there's a lot of different foot positions you have to consider. And uh, again, in my book, I cover a lot about that stuff, which is uh, not related to our rig at all. We do use our legs, but you know, that's obviously worth considering. And that's about it, really, Chris. So uh, this, this is fascinating. Travis, Travis is, this is, he's never steered a, a sailing canoe in his life. So I've just chucked him in and I'm just telling him what to do. And uh, Again, you know, it's just a multidisciplinary thing. He's never steered, never steered a sailing canoe. Just jumps in. Take, I, I do, I do the sailing part, and he he does the steering, and off we go. You know, and that's that's the beauty about having these skills. You just jump between. This is why you see Kai Lenny and all these guys are jumping one and another and other. It's because they've got seventy percent of the stuff already learned. They just have to add an, a bolt on the extra twenty percent or twenty five percent, and off they go. I wouldn't imagine, Steve, that there's too many uh, Hawaiian sailing canoes in <laughs> in the British Isles. So you're probably one I, I, of, uh, yeah, maybe, got, the, maybe even the only one. I've got the only one in Europe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a great piece of kit. Is is that the one that you uh, um, shipped back from? Was it Fiji? Yeah, that was, this one had been, they, these are built in uh, California in Lake Tahoe <clears throat> by a friend of mine. And then this one ended up in Hawaii racing for three or four years and went back to LA 
I purchased it, then took it back to Mauritius for a couple of years, and then I brought it back over to England. So it's yeah, very so, well um, travelled, Ben. <laughs> it's very well travelled, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Steve, um, fantastic presentation. I mean, I, I, I know personally that this, this, this topic we could talk for hours on, and this is just a, a very brief introduction to a, a very wonderful and complex um, sport. A couple of questions that are coming through. Um, so, um, one question here is, um, do all OC1s have the same design characteristics, i.e. the whole shape, the rocker, the volume, Oh, and, and, and of course the length, that, that's come from Mark. And um, if you could just quickly give us a brief answer to that one. Yeah, okay, so um, okay, there, there, are, there are OC1s that are designed more for flat water, so they have less rocker and they're quite narrow um, and they tend to be a little longer. The ocean canoes tend to be a little shorter and they tend to be a little, a little fatter in the middle with more, with more curvature, uh, more rocker. Um, so it depends really what you want to do. Um, but my advice generally is, you know, for our waters, get something with a bit more rocker and it's good for, good for the rougher waters. The flat water canoes are a little specialist and that, you know, so you're not going to get some, quite so much value out of it. So do look for the length. I mean, 21 foot's about normal, but you will find some that are a little longer. Now, again, depending where you're going to source these canoes from, but if you go to France, there are, again, there are, there are a few varieties out there on the market, but I would um, to say go for the ones that are ocean based, uh, a little shorter. Um, with a bit more volume and if you're a small guy go for small if you can find a smaller volume canoe is a good thing if you're a bigger guy um, go for the uh, you know go for the, uh, the, the larger volume and for the girls you know girls you know again go go small volume if you get a really big volume canoe that's a one man it's, it's a real pig to handle to be honest I, I, I had a very small volume canoe for years I thought I'm a small guy you know, 76 kilos, and oh, I'll get away with a small canoe, but it was very straight with minimal rocker. And I, I switched to a canoe uh, after six years, six years, uh, that had more volume and more rocker, and, and the four hours you know, just flew. It, the difference was huge. And predominantly carbon fiber, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, they are, there are glass boats available, and there are the, the carbon fibers. Again, you know, I, I, the way I look at it is this, you know, if uh, carbon fiber will last a lot longer, so it's an, in, it is an investment. Uh, you do have the, the, the glass boats are nice, but they do they can be compromised and they can take on water and they can get heavier. That's that which can be an issue with those boats, um, in particular. And uh, but if 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 finances are a problem, there's there is quite a big difference between a carbon boat and a glass boat. You know, and it's, it's a significant amount of money. It might be my eight hundred pounds or something like that. Too. It's quite a big 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 jump in money. But if you could save up and, and squeeze the extra and get the carbon, that's what I would advise you to do. Yeah, and predominantly, like you say, it's quite a big investment for people. Um, and I, I've got to ask, would you know, people, if they do, if any of us do come across kit that's advertised, would, would you mind at all if um, people were to contact you um, direct um, just to get some advice and, you know, yep. discuss, would this be the right OC one for me? Um, would, would you be sure. up for that, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any any time, just just uh, ping me a photograph, and uh, again, I'm on Facebook, Steve West, or through CanoeCulture.com. Just send me just the emails there, and uh, have a look for you. Absolutely. Yeah, and they can always, like I say, Steve's going to be at um, at our symposium on uh, Hailing Island in October. So that um, really great opportunity to pick his brains, really, and hopefully we'll have some. Well, we will. We'll have some OC ones there. Um, a question coming from a good friend of yours, um, and I apologize if I don't pronounce the name right, but I think it's Tehrangi. Um, and Tehrangi's saying, hi, Steve, awesome to hear you share your knowledge. Um, thank you very much. Is it necessary to learn how to fly the AMA in V1? Yeah, good question. Um, look, um, necessary. Well, um, four, you know, I say it's, it's, it's only necessary from the point of view if you feel super comfortable with, with doing it. I mean, some of the masters do do it, and, but they do it very briefly. It's not something they, it's really not something they do very much of, to be fair. It's can more, you just, can I just interject, Steve? Can you, yeah. um, I'm showing my ignorance, total ignorance here, but yeah. could you just explain uh, what the reference is to fly in the armor? 
Okay, so flying arm is when you're you're paddling your canoe and then you just then you just basically kick it up and you've got your the, the arm of the float the float is actually above the water line, so it's flying effectively. Right. Okay. It's using contact with one now. The advantages are of course you reduce your drag and having you reduce drag you should be going faster. But there's a lot of people who actually think, you know, it's a bit dodgy as to whether you do get gain much speed. What what I find it what I find it can do it can. It does two things. What it does is when you when you put your canoe on the edge, so you, you imagine the hull's here. When you when you roll it over, you actually increase your water line length. You actually reduce your wetted surface area. Uh, therefore, you reduce your drag, so you get a bit of extra speed. But it's not that much. And you, if you watch some of the great the greats in Tahiti, they don't they don't fly the arm that much, especially in racing. They might mess around on ways doing it. They might do that for school based stuff to sort of hone their skills because you know, it may happen during the course of a race. But when you watch them racing, they really, they really do it. Now, when you see OC1 guys racing, Molokai, for example, they do fly the armor quite a lot. But you don't see the Tishan boys flying them so much, but you do see the Hawaiian guys doing it. And they do that for, again, because they can compensate with the rudder. They've got the rudder there and they, and they, they, they practice that as a, as a part of the paddling skill with, with an OC1. But the V1, Discussions I've had with the guys, they it's something they do, they play with, but when they race, it's more like the risks are almost like not worth it. It's like just uh, keep it keep contact. They keep it certainly very light. And they to try and keep the minimize the, 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 the weight, and every now and then it'll pop up for sure. And unless it's something really significant that's worth flying it for a bit of, a bit of a thrill, but they're really not going to risk it. They, they just keep tend to just maintain contact. So, but I hope that makes that 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 helps. Um, that was a funny, I had a discussion with Maui Kajelson years ago, and years and years and years ago, uh, Chris Kajelson's uh, son, who you might know, but, um, you know, Maui used to say, oh, no, man, flying the arm is just kind of like, it's just kind of a waste of time. I went and did, I went and saw the Ito race a few times. The guys weren't flying the arm, they just, they just weren't. They were just more, they were more focused on padding and doing little party tricks. They were just more, you know, boom, 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 just working in front of the stroke and sitting up and just working it. They weren't, I remember, the arm on a V1, a lot of them are so small, it's so, so low volume, it's simply not worth it. But in the OC1s, it can be a lot more meaty, so it kind of pays to get them out of the water a bit more often. So I hope um, that helps. Yeah, well, while we're talking about the armor, um, you know, we live in a pretty design progressional world. Um, do, you, do you see hull design and maybe the use of armor being used in SUP, either as a development or possibly as an aid? For paddlers who may find SUP challenging in, in certain conditions? I mean, is that too radical or not well, possible? No, it's not radical at all. In fact, I, have, I've, I was going to post a photograph of a friend of mine who actually, desi who actually designed these in the early days. He had, Ari, he had a stand-up paddleboard with an outrigger um, Ari on the side of it. And it's totally, totally plausible to do. And uh, it does open up a whole new world. It's, it's actually, it's, um, it's interesting, put it that way. Um, it allows you, it's a bit like, see, one of the reasons the V1s and the OC1s are so quick is that we can make a seriously narrow, rounded hull. It's got no flat spots on it. It's, like a, it's almost like a C1. It's, it's very, very quick and highly efficient. Uh, but we, we can compensate for the tippiness by having the armor, having the float. Yeah. So you, yeah. you can think about that in terms of, well, could you do that with, with stand-up? Well, you could. You could actually, actually, we could design a much faster hull if we had a little, float, little uh, armor sort of device handling it. Now they did experiment those. I mean, Mark Rapport designed quite a few in the early days. He had single and double outrigger canoe outrigger styled uh, uh, standouts. Of course, they were you know, pretty much uh, I wouldn't say banned, but they were frowned upon. Let's put it that way. Um, but I think as a training device, why not? Because look, there's a lot of people out there that compromise that can't do standout because they literally have done out the balance. They keep falling off. They're stressed. It's not. They're not getting any enjoyment out of it. What about people with disabilities? What about people with balance issues, with you know, middle, with ear, ear, uh, ear problems? You know, why not design some of this actually yeah. fast, yeah. but not instead of having thirty six inches wide, have it you know have it twenty eight, twenty seven with little training wheels on the side. That's so bad, probably not. Yeah, the more people you know that we can encourage into the sport with these innovations, fantastic. And it's yeah. interesting to hear that it's actually already. Um, be the concepts being actually put into manufacturing so maybe something we'll see in the future um i am a little mindful of, of time steve we we have overrun quite a lot uh 
for quite a long time here. Just a couple more questions, if you don't mind, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so Nick's asking, Nick Evans is saying, um, long thin paddle rather than a teardrop. I, I, he's saying, I guess you could relate that to the difference between a Greenland paddle and a Euro blade for kayaking. Mm -hmm. um, he said, do you think a Greenland type blade might be beneficial for SUP? Yeah, I, 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 well, I do. Um, you know, and this is the thing. I mean, I, I just don't think that we're, that the, the, the Aria canoe uh, paddle makers are not thinking outside the loop and they're not, they're not taking enough risk and they're not looking outside, you know, their own sort of bubble they live in. And I think that even the people coming into the sport and offering them advice, you know, not, you know, they, they're still, our canoe paddles at heart. There's still people not coming from a, a, a diverse enough sort of background to bring in something completely radically new. You know, I'm sure some African dude turn up from Senegal would be standing and paddling all his life. He'd, go, he'd look at our paddle and go, "That's crazy. What are you? What are you doing? I want mine to look completely different." Um, just as an Inuit would. Um, so, no, I can understand where you're coming from there, Nick, because um, you know, and I think hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from. I mean, it's all to do with the, with the relative. You see, when you're standing up on the stand-up paddleboard, your center of effort, your center of gravity or effort, sorry, sorry, center of gravity rather is very high. Because it's very high, you kind of need to offset that. And in a way, you know, if you have a long, a longer uh, paddle that's narrower, you know, that means you can actually get your center of effort uh, on the on the paddle you know, quite a bit deeper. It sits a lot further down. You know, it's, it's sort of being down at the tip. It's sort of up here. So you, can, you put it down, and you, and you can get get a better a better feel. But the most important thing about it is this: see, when you have a triangle like this, so I'll quickly show you. If you uh, oh, damn it, oh yeah, here it is. So when you have a paddle like this, so everything's down the bottom. But there's no, there's nothing. There's nothing here, so the water just you know the water's just, just falling on the side. So the thing just constantly just it just constantly wants to sort of cap it wants to capsize on itself, go forward like like this. But when you have something that's got longer straighter sides, it will hold form for a lot easier for a lot longer period of time. And that's that's the cru crux of the matter. And of course, comes back to this lever arm, first class lever, second class lever. As a second class lever, if it were the fulcrum point, the blade. You want it to stay vertical for as long as possible. So it's, the moment it starts to go from a, a neutral to a negative, as it starts to fall away, you've lost the advantage because of the surface area is compromised and the water is going off it. But if you have a long, tall one, it'll stay vertical for longer because it's not. It hasn't got. It's not triangular. It's not rocket science, but it does make it does make sense. Yeah. Well, we can build uh, and discuss this further in the development sessions that you're going to run on the Wednesday with the paddle stroke as well. So, um, look out for that one, um, guys. It's going to be advertised on a, on a, well, advertised on the site soon. Um, just finally, Steve Jocelyn's asking, um, would you would you be able to do a V1 session, a coaching one as well? And I'm not quite sure what she's getting at here, but she's uh, Jocelyn's saying, has Steve got room in his garden for a V6? <laughs> whether whether um, Jocelyn has one or she's just intimating, let's go out and buy one and get everybody in a six man. Well, I can. Yeah, I mean, I keep my my sailing canoe. I keep it at the at the Hayden Island Sailing Club, and um, I'm, I'm on good terms with them. They're actually they 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 are open to keeping another one down there actually. In fact, I'm really, they're keen to sort of potentially have a, like a club setting up themselves. But what I said to them is one of the best ways to do that is to put a canoe down there and that I would make, I would look after, I would take charge or I would look after. And then if people want to come down and paddle it, um, if whoever, whoever leaves it there, they come down when they like to use it, of course, um, on maybe a quick pro co basis. But at the end of the day, yes, I mean, I could, that, if that's something that, that she'd like to do, we can we could talk about doing it for sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, People who are stuck in land with canoes, at least on uh, elsewhere, and they want to come and paddle in the ocean, you know, what a, what a great spot to come to like Hailing Island. Um, and so certainly the V1 stuff, yes, I mean, doing some clinics and little workshops with that would be you know, absolutely fine. Yeah, and I, and I know that um, Glenn, Glenn Eldridge down in the St. Ives area has a, has a, um, a six man, I think it is, he has. So there's another option for people who might be um, in the Southwest. Um, yeah. 
So, so I'd just like to say on behalf of Water Skills Academy, Steve, um, fantastic introduction um, to to the OC world. I mean, I'm itching to have a go myself. I'm, as you know, I'm I'm fortunate enough to be sat in the perfect place right now with a guy who lives opposite me who's got one on his roof, and I'm probably going to run right over there after this presentation and say, um, "Can I have a go, please?" Um, but yeah. Brilliant. And on behalf of uh, all the WSA, thanks ever so much. Anyone who has um, any questions can send them through after this uh, session to Steve um, and again with his books. Um, Bournemouth actually has a, a, an Outrigger canoe yep. set up, I believe, as well. They have a club, don't they? Um, yes. They may have maybe two six mans, perhaps. I think they've got quite a few guys and girls who paddle the one man so that's a good that's definitely a good venue to go to to, to try out again you know it's, it's something i could arrange with ryan perhaps you know yeah excellent so um I'll, I'll take this opportunity to sign off now so thanks thanks once again thanks for everyone for listening stay safe and hopefully yeah. we'll be uh, able to be back on the water again soon watch out for the uh, the next webinars that are coming up due and everything's advertised on the water skills academy facebook so thank you very much and stay safe everyone thanks very much steve pleasure guys take care take care